The Road to Autonomy is presented by the Road to Autonomy Index. The Road to Autonomy Index is a rules-based equity benchmark index that measures the performance of a basket of global companies that are involved in the development and commercialization of autonomy. Institutional investors and fund managers are watching megatrends that are shaping investment opportunities today. These megatrends are creating thematic investment ideas and opportunities for forward-thinking investors. We believe that one of the biggest megatrends today is autonomy. That's why we created the Road to Autonomy Index, the world's first and only pure play index to track the thematic investment opportunity in autonomy. Follow the Road to Autonomy Index on your favorite finance app by simply typing in the ticker autonomy. To learn more about the Road to Autonomy Index, visit roadtoautonomy.com forward slash index. Hello and welcome to the Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome Ali Javidan, founder and CEO of Range Energy. Ali, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here because hybrid technology is going to play a large role in the future of logistics because it's going to have a positive economic benefit. Ali, where did the inspiration for electrified trailers come from? So I've worked in the automotive industry for about 25 years specifically on electric on vehicle electrification for the last 15 years and spent some time early days at Tesla working on the Model S and, and all of the other programs there. And uh, I spent some time after that at Google and then again in the automotive space at Zooks helping develop the RoboTaxi. The funny anecdotes is that I've been around trucks and trailers, mostly medium and light duty, but around trucks and trailers all my life. Ever since I was a kid, I grew up around my uncle's farm, moving trailers around, getting work done and, and all of that stuff. So it's it's always been kind of part of my ecosystem. And so as I started to explore my next opportunities to help further to decarbonization of our vehicles on the roadway, I started to think about what industries need this the most. And, and if you think about the commercial trucking industry, that's, although it's only about 5% of the vehicles on the road, it accounts for somewhere around 25 to 30% of the harmful emissions in the air. That was a kind of aha moment. And obviously working in, in electrification, I started thinking, okay, what kind of electric things can I build here? I saw the tractors, the E-Cascadia and the Tesla Semi and and I saw a lot of work being done around that. But I thought to myself, well, these fleets have recently spent millions, tens of millions of dollars, some of them on new uh, diesel tractors. And if you think about the install base, there's nearly 3 million diesel tractors on the road in the United States. And so to think about replacing all of those expensive tractors and then the, the infrastructure that's required to deploy that in a, in a full electric primary mover kind of modality, I just saw that being really, really far out, a lot farther out than what a lot of these kind of organizations were trying to propose. And so that's when that idea of hybridization came in. And I started to think to myself, well, I think we can actually get a pretty far way there hybridizing some of these uh, systems. And what's the most effective way of doing this? And, and just at about that time, I started to notice that Every piece of technology that's being proposed for the commercial trucking industry has focused exclusively on the tractor. And nobody's thinking about the trailer. And so that's that kind of aha moment that happened about a, two and a half years ago where it was just, well, holy crap, what if we electrified the trailer? What happens? And this was a weird idea that we even talked about back in 2008 eight time frame, 2007 time frame with the very early Tesla R&D team. This was one of those ideas that just kind of popped up and it came back up a couple of years ago. And I said, this has to be done. And so taking a survey of the industry, nobody was paying attention to trailers except for a few nerds and myself. And, and so I decided to start a, a venture trying to, to help bring some real technology to the trailer and really help hybridize these fleets in a meaningful way without disrupting how the fleets work. And, and that's the beauty of using these trailers. You're taking the Toyota approach because Toyota realized very smartly, and we're I'm going to localize on the Japanese market there, the infrastructure for electric vehicles passenger wasn't there. And Toyota continues to invest in their fuel cell and, and hybrid technology, and it's doing very well. As we've seen globally, EV sales are, are slowing down. And then on the large class eight side, which you're focused on, I have not seen a credible, I repeat, a, a, a credible investment theory of how you're going to repay the capital expense to build out the charging infrastructure. And so you're coming in there and saying, the economics don't make sense today, especially if you're, if you're going to buy an e-cascade, the, the astronomical difference or the, is over hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to upgrade. $300,000 more for the electric day cab. So it's one hundred and seventy dollars for the diesel, 
470 for the electric version, which is kind of crazy for me. You can't pay for it. So here you are, you're taking the very smart Toyota approach around hybridization. How are the fleets and carriers reacting to that approach? Because you're giving them a way to decarbonize. I'm sure there's other efficiencies, especially around the economics that you're improving from. Are they welcoming you and saying, hey, Ali, this is a really great step? Initially, no. Initially, they're responding to us as, hey, you're another Silicon Valley tech company telling us what we need. We've been listening to you and we spent money with you. And now all, all of a sudden we have electric tractors that don't get the range that we were expecting. We have charging networks that can't be deployed by our local governments. So you better have something really good to show us. And so then when we start showing them that like, hey, we're actually electrifying the trailer. And because we're electrifying the trailer, we can put a smaller battery pack. And because we can put a smaller battery pack, we have less of an impact on the load that you can carry, almost no impact in most cases. And because it's a smaller battery pack, it's a more reasonable cost. We're not asking you to pay 4X or, or even more your cost of your base legacy product for this new product. And best of all, you can charge at the loading docks using the power that's already at the loading docks. And so then this ends up becoming like all of those problems that this new push of electrification or whatever the future technology may be, even hydrogen or some form of autonomy, we've really sat down systematically with industry experts, with partners, and went and gone through all of those operational touch points that most folks are not thinking about and understanding how much power is at a typical loading dock. And what loading docks don't have power, where else is there shore power? So if you have like a bring down area where you're trying to cool down a refrigerated trailer before it gets to the loading dock, well, can we use that power infrastructure not only to refrigerate the trailers, but to charge our systems and using our trailer as kind of a power gateway to the refrigerator? And so now using that trailer, its flexibility in moving goods is matched in its flexibility as a power architecture, a power platform for all of these other new accessories that we're looking at, whether they're electric TRUs or new high-performing electric lift gates or camera systems or new telemetry, we now can provide the power platform for all of these new things. So you can be on one unique platform for both power and communication, then that ties into a tool like Fleet Pulse or another telemetry system. Then the fleets have all of the exposure to all of the underlying bits and pieces. And you can really only do this through the trailer and understanding the usage patterns of a trailer as opposed to the usage patterns of a tractor in a fleet. Are the fleets seeing increase in fuel efficiency from deploying the electric trailer? On a typical route, we show that we can do somewhere between 30 and 40% fuel efficiency on a mixed route. That includes you know, a little bit of highway, a little bit of city. And now obviously, if you're on the highway, it's 20 to 30 percent. If it's if you're exclusively in a city with heavy loads, let's say beverage distribution, then you're actually closer to 40 to 50 percent. We did some testing with MVTS earlier this year on our alpha hardware. So it's half of the power output and a, a less efficient drive system. And we still achieved 37 percent better fuel economy from an, an untouched off the shelf tractor. And it can be a 1975 Kenworth or a brand new Freightliner uh, diesel Cascadia, and we still have the same effect on both of those systems. Thirty to forty percent fuel efficiency. If we, we look at that over, amortize it over, say twelve months, twenty four months, thirty six months. Where in that in that cycle, let's call that three year cycle, is the payback period for just what they're going to save on on the fuel based on? Let's, I'll use a simple number: seventy dollars a barrel right now. We we haven't released the pricing on the trailer yet. But if you can imagine that the pricing of our trailer will be similar to what fleets are paying for a fully outfitted refrigerated trailer. So this is, you know, less than $200,000. It actually, in most cases, will be dramatically less than $200,000. So I would say it's kind of the high end of a typical trailer price. Now, you're talking about fuel consumption. So we have one fleet that we're working with right now has 3,000 trailers. And their annual fuel bill, not including the TRUs, is $20 million. And so if, if we can cut let's say conservatively 20% of that bill, that's a dramatic benefit to these fleets. And if you think the air skirts that are mandated in California or the, the trailer wings that are being used out there, these are like two, 3%, maybe 4% at best, better fuel economy. We're getting this number up to 40 pretty easily. And one thing to mention is that 40% reduction in fuel consumption actually equals somewhere around 70% reduction in harmful emissions output. 
because not only are we helping augment the torque, we're actually helping augment the torque of the diesel truck where it's least efficient. So foot to the floor, accelerating up a hill, that's where we're assisting the most. And that's where the diesel tractor is the least efficient. And so we really help shave off those inefficient spikes through the diesel system. And we end up outsizing our emissions effect beyond just the cuts in the fuel. It's really well done. How do you see fleets integrating electrified trailers in their operation? Is it going to be on a lane by lane basis or what's the strategy for that? So we have several fleets that will be getting our trailers in 2024 in, in beta pilots, and we're doing exactly that. We've identified several different lanes per fleet, we're, and we're actively doing modeling with these fleets. You have to remember, so the fleets that we're working with are all large, modern, sophisticated fleets. So they have their own efficiency models. They have all kinds of different tools that they use every day to quantify their work. And we're actually tying our energy models into their efficiency models so that we can actually simulate those lanes to see what makes the most sense for the trucks. Now, we choose one. We've already chosen one for a beverage distributor in Southern California, and we start running that route. And then we start looking at the data from the trailer in that route, and then we start adding on our algorithms that start to do uh, torque efficiency, trip efficiency, can even respond back and tell the driver, hey, if you actually, you don't need to go foot to the floor at this intersection anymore. If you change your behaviors a little bit this way, we could actually get you another 2 or 3% fuel economy. So there's a few different ways that are going to be deployed, but I think fundamentally it's going to be exactly like you mentioned. We're going to choose the lanes that we think are the most, will see the most benefit, gain the trust with the fleets. They will start buying tens of or, or hundreds of trailers at the beginning to test in these. And these are massive fleets, obviously. And then as they start to gain confidence, then they'll continue to work with the trailer OEM that they buy their trailers from already. Any of the top three or four that you can name, they will buy it with our technology embedded. And then as they start to cycle their fleet through, they'll cycle them through with range powered trailers. And is your end customer at the end of the day, the globally renowned trailer makers at the end of the day, or are you going to do this on your own and partner with a commercial bank, perhaps to, for the line of credit, and then perhaps you lease them out there and hold them on a commercial bank's paper, not on your paper? I think that business model, it sounds really good, and I think it could work in some form maybe in the future. But today, we're entering the market exactly the same way as, uh, let's say, a carrier or a thermal king does. So you buy your trailer, let's say you and I had a small fleet or a large fleet. We buy our trailers from Great Dane and we want to put a Thermo King reefer unit on it. So we buy the trailer from Great Dane. We call Thermo King and say, hey, Thermo King, I have 10 trailers in the Great Dane yard. I need you to put the reefer units on them. And then we have our guy go and pick them up. It's going to be something similar to that at the beginning. And then as we start to establish these deeper relationships with the trailer OEMs, the Great Danes and Hyundais and Wabashes of the world, then we'll actually, just like kind of Hendrickson presents their suspension assembly and they assemble it on their factory line, we'll just be part of that as a, kind of a fundamental foundational component that goes into the factory line. And, and none of this is set in stone yet. We may have to pivot on some of this strategy, but these are the conversations that we're having with the trailer OEMs. I like it from a business standpoint because there's multiple, I'll use the word, I'm going to be very lawyerish here, I'll use, but there's multiple potential paths to commercialization and in, in for scaling. You're not limited to one path where you can run into a dead and there's multiple paths to get to commercialization for you. Correct. And there's also multiple paths. We have almost extreme level of empathy for our customers, be it the drivers or the fleets. And we wanted to make sure that even the fleets have multiple paths of accessing this technology. It's easy to, to say, okay, Walmart, Amazon, Pepsi, and JB Hunt, this is for you, go for it. But then what about all of those smaller fleets that are operating tens of or hundreds of trailers? Well, that's where we go to the riders and the JB Hunts of the world. And we say, add this as a menu item for your customers. And we're doing that exactly with some of these fleet brokers or some of these large brokers to say, okay, how do we service the small guy? And we service them through some of these brokers. And that way, nobody has to think about a new business model. Nobody has to compile some new kind of thought in their head of, does this make sense for me? It's all the same. The numbers are just a little bit tweaked, but basically how you think about your money in versus your money out is not going to change with this business model. You highlighted two friends of the podcast. You got Mike Plensey over at Ryder. Mike he does really great things there. And then you got... I'll call him the legend, Craig, because I know you listen every time. You got Craig Harper over at, at J.B. Hunt. And I have to ask this because 
Craig will probably text me or call me if I don't ask you this. So I got to ask you, how are the professional drivers reacting to this technology? Are they enjoy driving? Can you shed some light on that? And Craig, that's for you, sir. So first of all, massive shout out to Craig, who is actually one of my favorite people in the industry. And part of that is because he asks me the hardest questions and his team is really incredible. We have a professional driver on staff who has been driving truck and trailer for nearly 30 years. The last almost 10 years have been focused on working in some of these new fleets or managing his own fleet with new technologies. And so he actually has this really good crossover talent that is the traditional trucking mentality, but thinking about it in through the lens of a new product kind of a world. So he's our first test for us that says, how does this feel, Jeff? In addition to that, as we deploy pilots, so we've had one big pilot in Southern California with our alpha hardware, and we're going to have several more in 2024 with our beta hardware, we do driver surveys. And so the first driver survey that we did was with this beverage distributor in Southern California, we asked them, can we do a a survey with your drivers? Because we basically handed the trailer off to them and stepped back and said, what are you going to do with it? They charged using the extra 1450 power outlet that was already at the loading dock overnight, everything worked. And so they said, hey, we did this driver survey from this other electric tractor company, not Tesla. Our drivers gave the product a scorecard. Do you want to do something similar for your trailer? And I said, you know what? Give me that exact survey. Take that exact survey. You can take things out of it if you want, but give it to me those same questions or give it to your drivers after and let's score apples to apples. Let's do do the same question. So what ended up happening was they copied and pasted the survey. The drivers that did the electric tractor pilot just a couple of months before were the same drivers that were driving diesel day cabs with our trailers. The electric tractors scored 77 out of 108 possible points for driver behavior or driver satisfaction. Our trailer scored 105 out of 108. And every time the driver got out and they said, you turn my diesel tractor into a Tesla. Because what we do is we very carefully fill the torque in between the shifts. And we also make sure that we understand, are you trying to pass? Are you trying to go up a hill? Are you trying to decelerate? Are you trying to do threshold braking? And we have different algorithms for every one of these different states. And it almost makes the trailer feel like it has this intuition for the driver. Don't forget, I've driven trucks and trailers my entire life. Before I was doing electrification, I was a race engineer. And my job was to give the racing driver the best confidence in the car possible. And even in our mission statement, it says that we want to do all this work is for the driver so that the driver at the end of the day gets out of that tractor feeling more comfortable and safe than they've ever done before after a very long, hard day of driving. Because I'm sure you know how exhausting even just a couple of hours in a tractor trailer can be driving through traffic, over the road, fill in your blanks. But I know that our product is working if that driver gets out and says, holy shit, this felt really good. I felt confident going up that hill. I felt safe going down that hill, which is even more important. There's a a little story, if we have a couple of minutes, that I can tell you about a grapevine run that we did. So the grapevine is a 42-mile stretch in Southern California on I-5, 6% grade in both directions. So it's a big hill to go over. Typically, you're at foot to the floor, 50 miles an hour up that hill with a partially loaded trailer. You're getting passed by Priuses that don't even care about you. And you're just hoping that you don't have a misfire, you don't have something that causes you to start your momentum all over again. You get to the top of the hill, you take a breath, and then holy shit, you see that hill, that grade on the other side. Jake brake all the way on, put it in the right gear, and just hope that you don't burn your brakes up going down that hill. And if you're lucky, you get six miles per gallon on that run. We took our standard Freightliner Cascadia with our trailer, Alpha Hardware, 60% throttle, doing 55 miles an hour up that hill without a sweat, On the backside of the hill, he used the engine brake to set the speed. So basically set the speed at 55 miles an hour, let go of the throttle and the brake. The trailer turned on its regen and held the speed of the entire tractor trailer down the hill. The brakes were cold all the way down that hill. And if the driver ever got cut off or had to do some kind of a threshold maneuver, he had nice, cold, fresh brakes to use. Otherwise, we put 10 kilowatt hours back into that battery pack on the backside of that hill and we got 11.03 miles per gallon on that run. And that's all with Alpha hardware. That gives one example of the power of this technology. When we showed that data to that Southern California fleet, 
they had eliminated that hill from their drive routes. And they said, you know what, now we can put that back in. So it's it becomes a really big deal and game changer for a lot of these fleets. You almost double efficiency there. The Keeping the brakes cold is interesting because you have a positive environmental aspect there because you don't have all the brakes coming out. The particulates, the wasted heat, all of that stuff. And, and the service intervals, like keep it simple. I, even if we can extend the service intervals by three to five X on your brakes, that's an $8,000 brake job that you can put aside for three times. So the emissions from the braking systems alone are huge. I used to work on the roadways when I was a student engineer. I worked at Caltrans and I was working on the roadways every day. And you see the dust. You come out after your shift and on your hard hat, you can see the dust on your hat. And a lot of that is from the brakes and these coming down these big hills. And so it's a big deal. You have the positive economic benefits. You have the positive environmental benefits that we've only scratched the surface on that. And then there's more there we can get into in a minute. But it seems to me that you're increasing the safety of the driver because it doesn't seem like they're going to get as fatigued or as stressed out, especially if you're going through the, I've driven the grapevine, not an 18 wheeler, but you have to be on guard in some of those routes through Southern California, especially going from Southern California into Arizona. They're long, they're boring. Or if you're going to go through the Cajon Pass on your way out through Barso to Vegas, stressful. I got stuck in a snowstorm going through that once. It's a stressful environment. It's incredibly stressful. And I think one of the things that we undersell ourselves on right now is the safety aspects of all of this. And the reason is that I take safety incredibly seriously. A lot of the team here comes from a world where we were developing a level five robo taxi to go on public roads. And you know how difficult it is to remove the safety driver. So we're bringing a lot of that discipline the, all of the different kind of HARA levels and all of the torque security and, and signal integrity, all of those different things that we cared so much about when it was time to remove the driver and autonomy, we're bringing here because we understand how critical safety is. And now I will say after the beta program, after 2024 or mid-2024, you will see us raising that safety flag because then we'll have data that shows exactly how many collisions or, or how many brake incidences may we be able to abate. What are the new lanes that we may be able to unlock? Because now we have traction. We have actual traction motors in the trailer. So we can actually drive the trailer through snow, through ice. We can help folks get unstuck on things. We can actually allow you to turn your tractor off and very gently be pushed out of a port if you don't want to be idling at the port while you're waiting. There's so many of these kind of secondary benefits that are related to safety, related to further emission savings that we'll be starting to talk about in 2024, but until we won't talk about it until we have data. I don't want to fall into the trap of, of some of the other folks that are introducing new uh, products to the world. Once we have the data to prove it, once we have independent data to prove it, that's when the world will know the, the details of all of that work. When you have the data, then do you shop that to insurance companies to see if your clients and customers get cheaper rates? In fact, they are one of the very... So Department of Transportation, Department of Energy... Some of the trucking councils, our commercial partners, and our insurance partners are the folks that we are talking to today about all of these safety implications. So the public doesn't know so much about what we're doing, but those in organizations, especially the insurance organizations, know exactly what we're doing. And we're working with all of them because if we can help make your insurance prices cheaper on your fleet, that's, that's yet another reason to bring this technology into your fleet. The fuel savings, the potential fuel savings, potential insurance savings, it starts to pay for itself. Now you have a very, very compelling product that the CFO is going to have a lot easier time writing you an upfront check where they can clearly demonstrate from the data of what their payback is going to be. We're all on your way there. So you have the human-driven aspect, and I've been in the Zooks vehicle many times throughout the years, so all the different various prototypes from the track to the downtown San Francisco and all the various different things. The truck always worked well. You have the background in autonomy. You're building, I'm going to call a complementing tool to the trucking industry. How do you see what you're building with electrified trailers complementing autonomous trucking? You're one of the few that have asked me that question. And we actually have a pretty specific uh, charter around autonomy and trucking. If you think about autonomy and trucking, there are a couple of pieces that are being left out of the conversation currently. Part of the reason that we want to bring autonomy to trucking, obviously, is for efficiency, for safety, and eventually hoping to remove the burden from the driver. I don't want to say remove the driver, but the burden from the driver, thinking about constantly safety or all of this stuff. So the one area that nobody is talking about 
is the driver still has to get out. The driver still has to drop the landing gear. They still have to do, they have to move the slider to balance the load. There's so many other things that the driver does regarding the trailer that none of this autonomous stuff is talking about. Well, we're working with some of our friends that are working in the autonomous industry, specifically in trucking. I can, I don't want to name any big names, but they're the big names. And the goal here is to eventually start working directly with them to finish that last mile of autonomy through the trailer. And what I mean is now, because the trailer has a controls platform, a power platform, and a communications platform, we can automate the slider adjustment, for example. We can automate the lift gate doors or the lift gate itself. We can automate so many different little aspects of the trailer so that the driver doesn't then have to hop out and hop back into the tractor to go unlock the back of the trailer or to go hook the shore power up to the trailer. A lot of this stuff now becomes automated because the trailer now has its own power controls and communications platform. You're complementing what they're building. That's the goal here. As much as we can be framed as disruptors in this industry, we don't want to disrupt anything. We just want to give everybody better tools. Give me an example. Let's look at some famous trucking routes that are hard to drive. I'll use the term not fun to drive. And with you have great million milers, two million milers, three million miler professional drivers that are really good at it. But you look at some of the stuff going through Albuquerque into Taos on the 75 down there. The elevation changes there. Or if you go in some parts of South Dakota with the elevation change, I'll never forget it was my grandfather. And you see runaway truck and they have the, the way it's, it's designed. Your trailer potentially could mitigate those risks those lanes get automated. And that's special. Yeah. I mean, if you think about a stable system, you want your controls to be kind of behind your center of gravity going down a hill. I have a little model of a truck and trailer right in front of me. And when you're going down a hill, you want a lot of that braking actually ideally to come from the trailer, not from the tractor. Because you don't want at that point, the trailer is trying to race the tractor. And that's when jackknifing happens. Because of how we pull regen out and use the trailer axle to slow the entire system down, all of a sudden, we actually have a more naturally safe system. And so then going down a hill in low friction surfaces, the chances that you're going to have a jackknife are far less because you're not braking primarily from the tractor. You're braking primarily from the trailer side. And that can all be controlled intelligently. It's not an analog signal with your air brakes just turning a cam on and off. It's the motor actually really intelligently looking at wheel slip, looking at the, the IMU, which is telling it the essentially the internal gyroscope that tells it what the s- system stability is. It's a really, really sophisticated system. And, and we have that part of the safety system working. One of these days, we'll get you in one of our truck and trailers and we'll, we'll let you go out for a ride or a drive and, and you'll see the difference. You can immediately feel it. It's really, really cool. I'm taking you up on on the the drive, and I'm going to go back to my childhood here. I can't tell you how many times that I saw jackknife trailers. I grew up in Connecticut, 95, when we'd have black ice or some sort of storm, and an individual lost control or a human driver, a pedestrian driver, decided to cut the truck off, and the the driver had to, to do a maneuver. In a black ice environment, Can your system help some of that stability since that is very common, especially in the Northeast? I think at launch, our product, we're waiting on a couple of pieces of technology from the industry for us to really, really go full closed loop with our ABS and stability control. One of the challenges right now is that Society of Automotive Engineers, the SAE, or none of the tractor OEMs have come to a final conclusion on what this kind of unified tractor trailer data communications pipeline should look like. And as you know, there's a lot of work being done to establish that standard so that everybody can kind of get on the same page with communicating between the tractor and the trailer. That specifically will help unlock this kind of second layer of safety features, advanced stability control, advanced traction control, all of that closed loop jackknife control, all of that stuff really gets supercharged once that communications protocol gets standardized and incorporated into the tractors. But we can't wait on that. We can't inherently wait on a bunch of other stuff to happen because a little bit of kind of EV nerdery, that's specifically why we are in the charging network problem that we have right now for passenger vehicles. It is mainly because since around 2008, 2007 timeframe was the beginning of when they were trying to standardize a charging standard for passenger vehicles, you remember this, 
And everybody wanted to go, you know, there were basically three different ways. There was the European standard, the 1772, and then the, the Tesla standard, which we were trying to push even back then. Well, if we wait on these governing bodies to kind of settle in on a standard, it's going to take a while, let's just say. And so we're working really, really hardly, hard to establish a strong line of communication with the braking suppliers, with the ABS suppliers, with the tractor OEMs to see, do we have to wait for this communications protocol? Is there a way that we can shortcut this? So that's a very long, exhausting way to say that from the onset, we will not have these advanced stability control algorithms running, but we're going to continue to fight until either those standards become standardized and published, or we make more headway with the braking suppliers or the tractor suppliers to be able to get the data that we need to be able to provide this really advanced stability control. But I can promise you that it is coming. We're super driven to bring this to market. It seems to me that you're following back on your background of prototyping and developing, saying, we're just going to build. We're not going to wait. We're going to build and we're going to build a great product. The whole thing here is that I'm very proud to say that I'm one of the original early Tesla team that we had to create everything from scratch. We had to create battery packs and we had to create motors that were meant for vehicles. And we had to create communications architecture and controllers and new ABS controllers that are developed for electric vehicles rather than internal combustion vehicles. We had to do all of that from scratch back in the day. We don't want to do that again. And so we understand the value of kind of the, the timing that we have now, that a lot of this, this hardware is, is relatively mature. We want to make sure that we are bringing the most robust kit to this industry possible. This is not Tesla Roadster where there's a bunch of customers that are so in love with it that they don't care that half the time the door doesn't open. These are important fleets that are counting pennies and seconds. And so we're going to continue to develop and deliver the best and most reliable suite of hardware. And, and if we can do this independent of a lot of these standards coming to market, then great. But if it takes us working with the standards organizations to make sure that our product is robust and safe. That's exactly what we're doing now. And that's what we'll continue to do until we actually get all of those really fancy features into the trailers. And I predict it's going to be less than five years before we get that full suite, full functionality into our trailers on the roads in volume. We'll probably have it working and prototyping in the next 12 to 18 months. Your customers care about one thing, uptime. Downtime equals lost revenue. They care about uptime. When you sell them a product, it better be guaranteed to have a 99.99999% uptime or you're going to get a phone call in the middle of the night that you're not going to be too happy to take. That's the second most proud thing I have to share about that pilot that I did. The first was the, the driver scores. The second was that in that entire week, we had 15 minutes of downtime and we let them run that trailer by themselves. We were just there to observe, take notes, if there are any safety issues, deal with them. But they had a total of 15 minutes of downtime, and that was just because nobody had used that charger that we sent with them before. And once they figured it out, it was done. The whole week just worked. That's something that you can learn from and improve. What, what is the charging time for the, when the vehicles? Can you do it from the unloading process and the loading? Did the vehicle can charge up during then? We have two different charging scenarios. One is a level two charger. So if you just have 240 three-phase single phase or 480 three-phase single phase, we can do level two charging overnight. And then if you have a little bit more power, then we can actually do at 350 kilowatts, we can do DC fast charging in about 45 minutes. And that matches the typical dwell time at a loading dock at, let's say, a Prologis or Walmart or, or something like that. So the goal here is that if you're a very high performing fleet and you're ready to make investments like a Walmart or an Amazon, we can get you charging at the loading dock at the same amount of time it takes your forklift to load and unload the box, which is about 45 minutes. And if you're just starting to get into this, then we can actually charge overnight, either at the dock or off site at maybe a, a bring down area or something like that with no problem. Now we're getting interesting. So what's the timeline for commercial operations? You clearly made the case here today of why you made the economic case, the environmental case. And I'm sitting here, I run a fleet and said, okay, when are you going to begin commercial operations? we got a lot of fleet listeners. We are deploying about uh, five pilots in 2024. A lot of those customers have been selected. I'm sure one or two of them are actually listening. And then we're going to work through 2024 with those pilots. We're going to do a larger set of pilots somewhere around uh, 10 or 20 pilots in 2025. And then at the end of 2025, the customers that did those first pilots are going to start getting their real trailers. 
And so we'll be doing first deliveries of trailers in 2025 to our customers and then turning up the wick in 2026 and 2027. And the goal is to get at a pretty high cadence of trailers in 2027 and 2028. We'll still be supply constrained for a while to come, but I think it's going to match the refresh cycle of a lot of our top customers. So we're very optimistic that 2025 is the first time you're going to see these trailers in the wild in customers' hands. And then between then and 2027 and eight, we're going to be ramping up production and you're going to see these things all over the place. So you've got a very clear, stable ramp up period going here. Are there any regulatory curveballs that could come out of left field that can derail that? Are you pretty okay from a regulatory standpoint? We're actually okay from a regulatory standpoint for a couple of reasons. So there is a Truck and Trailer Manufacturers Association, Inc. versus the EPA filing date 2016. This was a case uh, that was brought in 2016, and there's been a bunch of case documents ever since then. But essentially, the landmark case was the EPA trying to put emissions regulations around trailers and the Truck and Trailer Manufacturers Association saying, pump your brakes. That's not how it works in the United States. And through a whole bunch of work, a lot of these older fleets, they used to build their own trailers. As a fleet manager, or fleet owner, I'm modifying my trailers. I'm cutting them apart. I'm moving things around. And if I don't have the freedom to do that, then I just become a consumer and I'm not able to run my fleet efficiently. And so uh, what ended up happening was that the EPA excluded a trailer from being designated a primary mover. And it says, even if it has a motor of propulsion, an electric motor, a diesel motor, hydraulic motor, it cannot be considered a motor vehicle. And that there, that regulation there, pretty much gives us an open window to bring these trailers onto the roadways. Now, we're not taking it lightly. Again, remember, we brought the Model S to the road. We brought uh, the Zoox Robo Taxi. These are things that took a lot of work on the regulatory side to get passed through. So I've already spent time in DC with the DOE, with the DOT, with the trucking uh, folks around how we are proving our safety. And again, when I said that there are a few people that we're having an open safety dialogue with, they're definitely on the front of that list. And so I'll give you one example of, of how we're making sure that we stay regulatory on the good graces of the regulators. Because I think at some point, there will be some types of regulations around this work, and we want to be the ones that are setting the tone for safety, not having to be subject to somebody else's kind of safety kind of requirements. But one strong example is about a year ago, before we put our first trailer on the road, through the contacts that I have, I got in contact with the commander of the Commercial Vehicle Division for California Highway Patrol. And him and I had worked, not him, but his organization and I had worked together in the past. And what we had done back at Tesla and again at Zooks was, hey, we're building this new thing that you're going to see on the highways. It has new safety implications. Let me show you exactly what we're doing. And I need to get your feedback on how we could be more safe for you if there's an incident on the side of the road. That ended up going a long way for us to get our vehicles on the road in California. And so we did that again here. And we actually had the head of the commercial vehicles division his staff. And then in fact, he brought his counterparts from Texas here and basically said, and we showed them everything that we're doing. They asked us a whole bunch of questions. In fact, one of the inspectors that they brought said that your workmanship looks better than most of the OEM workmanship on the trailers that we see. And then we followed that immediately by going to the local way station and getting an inspection, a field inspection, independent field inspection. And now every way station in the state of California has our my name on a business card, and they know that when our trailer passes through, what the difference is about this trailer and all of that. And so the reason I bring that example up is because that commander is also sitting in Sacramento at the state capitol when other folks are talking about roadway, weight allowances, and all of this stuff. And if he's the one that's raising his hand and saying, you know what, those range trailers are actually pretty cool, and they're pretty safe, and the team knows what they're doing, Then when we come back and we say, you know what, add us to that 2,000 pound or maybe add us to a 4,000 pound weight allowance for 2024, then we'll actually be in a better position to get that approval than if we didn't do all of that homework up front. It's trust and trust is a currency because you're giving transparency and trust and that is a currency that will allow you to scale your business because if that individual or another individual at the has a question, they can call you and they can walk you through it. And if you have to go there, you can go there, but they know that there's a phone number to call. And that's what this entire industry needs. 
For the longest time, Silicon Valley burnt the trust bridge. I'll just say it point blank. They burnt the trust bridge. And there's individuals like yourselves and the team at Reigns that are trying to rebuild the trust bridge and do it right. Zooks did, uh, did a really good job of building that that trust bridge. And that's what we have to have to have. I'm really curious. So you, you mentioned modifying the trailer. What does the process look like to modify and electrify an existing trailer? So... Currently, uh, you know, our goal is to ship brand new trailers that are electrified through these trailer OEMs to our customer. However, one of the things that I did do, and I know how much work is done by the fleets in the yards on these trailers. One of the things that we've done is we've made sure that every aspect of this trailer is retrofitable to an existing trailer. And so if you think about it, the slider rails have been standardized. The kingpin shape has been standardized. The two axle kind of Hendrickson architecture mostly has been standardized. Obviously, there are some differences in suspension geometry or brakes and things like that. And so what we're trying to do, what we've done is actually figured out what are those like break points. So a bogey can be swapped out or, you know, a tandem can be swapped out pretty easily in a yard. So then why don't we deliver a complete electrified tandem? rather than just the axle and a bunch of boxes that need to be bolted together. So we work with the Hendricksons of the world to develop this tandem that has the electrification in it. Then that gets delivered either to Great Dane or Hyundai or Wabash as a brand new product to be bolted under one of their new boxes, or as a kit with a battery and a new weld-in kingpin or a new bolt-in kingpin to the fleet. So for example, if you're a fleet that had, let's say you and I have a fleet, we just last year bought a thousand trailers and we don't want to swap them over again, then we can have range, put a tent up and work out a process with our fleet to retrofit those thousand trailers over the course of a month or two or three or however long it takes so that we can electrify. Now, I would say that's not my ideal go-to-market solution, but our system absolutely scales that way. And we will have a go-to-market path in that direction within a couple of years of launching the product through the OEMs. Again, you have multiple paths to successful commercialization. Ali, how do you see the market for electrified trailers evolving over the next decade? Do you see more competition coming online? Maybe some traditional OEMs are trying to license your technology, develop something in-house. How do you see the market evolving? I think what's going to end up happening is definitely we're going to have a few other companies that are going to either copy this solution or expand upon this solution. The one thing that's really important for us, specifically because of the question that you asked, is that we want to develop this product as a platform solution. And what I mean by that is it's very easy for me to say, hey, this works on a 48 foot or a 53 foot, has to have swing doors, it has to have this and it has to have that. Otherwise, sorry. Our system works whether it's a 36 foot reefer or a 53 foot dry van or kind of anything in between. I think what's going to happen is that we're going to have two or three basic trailer SKUs that everybody likes to work with. Like, let's say a 38 foot reefer for the food and beverage industry, 53 foot reefer and a 53 foot dry van, 48 foot dry van, fill in the blank. We'll have like three or four or five SKUs that kind of work on the majority of the trailer fleets that are out there. Then being a platform we're already looking at what comes after the box. If we think about container chassis, if we think about using now these trailers as for the military as mobile power stations or command units, there's a whole bunch of kind of secondary applications once you deliver power at this level with propulsion to the trailer. It really unlocks a bunch of new applications. But even thinking beyond class eight, we're already working with some of these folks that are operating mid-grade trucks in uh, cities to be able to put smaller scale trailers, class six, class seven, even smaller than down to a bumper pull trailer that's electrified and powered into some of these commercial operations through tighter cities to be able to utilize this same benefit with either, let's say, a new Rivian electric van or an old F-250. It doesn't really matter. It'll help either way. And so I would say, you know, we're really laser focused on the reefer and the dry van industry right now. We're open. We will have SKUs at all the different lengths and features, side doors and all of that stuff. But eventually we want to expand beyond the class eight market because I think there's a tremendous amount of benefit that could be had in other trailer forms. Just thinking about if I ever want to buy an electric boat, what if I could charge my electric boat at the side of the dock while I'm having lunch 
off of my trailer and I don't have to worry about charging infrastructure in Lake Tahoe. So there's a whole bunch of other kind of fun benefits here. Or if we're in the middle of the desert with a couple of electric dirt bikes, we can actually charge off of the trailer, get five or six charge cycles off the trailer, have fun all day and drive home in our Rivian and still get 250 miles of range towing a motorcycle trailer behind us. So there's a whole bunch of other benefits and, and future products that we're thinking about, but we're really laser focused on this trucking industry because we think that we can have the biggest benefit there. And frankly, it is they are the most important customer for us. I really, really like the vision. There's a lot of value there. There's potential. Many companies inside of Range Energy, as I was describing, because you said it very elegantly, a platform solution, and that's what you are. And the outdoor market is a very big potential, another TAM for, for you to go after, but you're laser focused on trucking today. And perhaps in the future, you can expand in other markets, but today, Range is laser focused on trucking. Ali, this has been insightful, sir. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. As we look to wrap up, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? I think for us, the biggest piece that we want to make sure that the industry understands is we have a tagline internal that we use. And, and I think most people should know this is that our innovation is driven by empathy. We have zero desire to toot our own horn or show the world what we're capable of doing. What we really want to do is first to learn from these fleets individually. We want to learn from the Craig Harpers of the world. We want to learn how we could be a benefit knowing what we know. And then we want to develop a product hand in hand with these fleets to make sure that when those products get developed, they have staying power in those fleets. And even the mechanics will be able to use the same tools they have in their toolbox on our stuff. And we're not going to introduce a whole bunch of new problems for everybody. So ultimately, it's really about empathy for the driver, for the fleets, for the operators. And we always lead with that. And I want every one of these fleets and every one of these customers and, and supply chain partners and, and trailer OEMs to know that if this product doesn't make the driver's day better or the fleet operator's day better, save some money and most importantly, help clean up those operations, then we have no desire in, in adding that feature or, or that product to the market. It's really, really about the effectiveness on the road. At the end of the day, it's a two-way relationship that's built on trust. The future is bright. The future is autonomous. The future is range energy. Ali, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Thank you so much. It was an honor. If you've enjoyed listening, please kindly rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Road to Autonomy. Or email podcast at roadtoautonomy.com. The Road to Autonomy podcast is produced by the Road to Autonomy LLC. The views and opinions expressed in the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect those views of the Road to Autonomy, its subsidiaries, its shareholders, directors, investors, or partners. The content discussed on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, investment, tax, or business advice. Nothing is a recommendation that you purchase, sell, or hold any security or other investment or that you pursue any investment style or strategy. The content of this podcast is presented on an as-is basis with no warranties, express, or implied of any kind. Financial mentions about companies in the Road to Autonomy Index and discussions about the Road to Autonomy Indexes are for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon when making any investment decision. Furthermore, an inclusion of security within the Road to Autonomy Index is not a recommendation by the Road to Autonomy Indices, LLC, to buy, sell, or hold that such security, nor is it considered to be investment advice.